Natural Resources Policy Finance Committee to order. Representative Torkelson, will you move the minutes of March 3rd? And Mr. Chair, I'm happy to do that. All, uh, discussion to the minutes of March 3rd. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. The minutes are adopted. <laughs> Members, we're going to have a discussion today on a number of AIS provisions. Um, we're laying out, Representative Draskowski, apologize, you're staggered. Uh, um, you're first and last, and I know you're not a member of this committee, so unfortunately uh, you're going to be able to either run back to your office and we can come and get you, or you'll have to stay here in between just to kind of make sense, members, to do it in the order we're going to go. First, we have House File 184, Representative Draskowski's bill, um, uh, which repeals the sticker. Uh, second is Representative Uglum's bill, which is, a, for lack of a better term, is the DNR's uh, modifications to the current law. Um, uh, both of those bills will be laid over for possible inclusion. We'll do them one at a time. Uh, Representative Uglum does have an amendment to his bill. And then last, we will have an informational discussion about Representative Draskowski's uh, House File 570, which is uh, actually, Representative Draskowski, is the first discussion in a House committee, other than the conference committee, about that $10 million tax provision. So it's going to be a real important discussion so we can have uh, interest groups uh, and folks understand what was passed in conference committee. So that's kind of a road map. I, just looking at them, I'd say we'll probably do about a third, third, third on the discussion purposes. Any questions by the members? Representative Draskowski, if you, uh, Representative Draskowski, I will move House File 184 for, uh, to be laid over for possible inclusion. Welcome and good morning. Welcome back to the committee. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Thank you and good morning, members. Um, uh, this bill, members, uh, <coughs> repeals the, uh, the statutes that were uh, enacted, I believe, in 2012 that uh, creates a, uh, an aquatic invasive species sticker for boat trailers and an associated uh, training program uh, for people in Minnesota and outside Minnesota that um, uh, wish to uh, continue to um, use their boats and boat trailers in the state. Um, the issue of aquatic, aquatic invasive species has consumed a great deal of time over the past five legislative sessions. People in many different parts of the state are concerned about the newly introduced species that live in a portion of Minnesota's lakes and streams and what that means to them and their ability to continue to utilize the abundance of natural resources with which our state has been blessed. In 2012, I was a member of this committee. Uh, we heard many provisions offered in several bills that were intended to help slow the spread of these new aquatic species in the lakes and streams that they had yet to inhabit. Uh, during that time frame, we saw bills with controversial provisions that required boat owners to submit themselves and their property to law enforcement inspections, to participate in newly designed boat washing efforts at many landings, and force them to travel in every instance with their boat, with the boat plug removed, or face government penalties. In addition that year, we saw the DNR push very, very hard for additional burdensome identification and training requirements that require law-abiding users of our lakes and streams to submit to yet another burdensome requirement to participate in a training program and to submit to an associated decal placement requirement in order to continue to use the same resources that they have used responsibly for generations. While I and others fought hard to remove this last straw from the camel's back, we fell short and the legislature succumbed to the placement of this added burden upon the fine people of Minnesota. The bill before you today repeals those unacceptable burdens of training and additional decal requirements that the legislature and government, governor have placed upon Minnesota's outdoor enthusiasts. I have heard from Minnesotans in every part of our state that are frustrated and angry with this new law. The general understanding is that state government has gone overboard in its burdening of the liberties of our citizens and it's time for the legislature to reel them back in. So Mr. Chair, um, those are my introductory remarks about the bill. Um, certainly uh, interested in questions and further discussions. And Mr. Chair, I think we've got some testifiers as well. Rep Representative Draskowski, I, I do want to bring to members' attention, uh, you did provide us, uh, I believe we got it from you, Representative Draskowski. Thank you. I had questions <coughs> this morning about the actual 
quiz. Um, members, it is a, a one-page handout you have with 10 questions. That yes, the, yes, Mr. Chair, that was offered by the DNR at the last hearing of this bill. So, um, uh, well, and you and you were the good legislator you are. You kept your copy so you could provide it to this committee. So, I thank you. I happened to put it in the file, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative Draskowski. Uh, this is. Uh, we'll hear testimony about this, but members, this is the proposed uh, questionnaire. Um, okay, <coughs> Representative Draskowski. I think we'll. Uh, uh, hear from the other. Any questions for Representative Traskowski? Representative Hamlin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, uh, welcome, uh, Representative Draskowski. And, uh, Mr. Chair, it's always great when uh, Representative Draskowski comes to committee. I such a short bill, but I I counted uh, I think four, maybe five burdens in your uh, in your presentation. One succumb, uh, one liberty, uh, a couple other uh, phrases. Um, you know, Representative Draskowski, back when we worked together a long time ago, you were an extension, and we we focused on trying to inform and educate people rather than do regulation. And I think that's what was attempted here, trying to get education out to folks, moving beyond the passive information distribution to actually having some type of, of training module. and. I'm wondering how, if, if we don't have this, what do we do? I mean, what do we do to the, uh, the risk, uh, current risk and the, and the ongoing risk for invasive species impacting not only our environment but our economy? Representative Draskowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Hansen. Um, yeah, and I know we're going to get into that discussion with this bill, and we did at, the, at uh, Representative Hackbar's committee as well. Um, and, you know, I, I think in this area, um, education is the role um, that needs to happen. Um, the question is, uh, should it be mandated and should it be forced upon people? And uh, obviously, uh, my belief and opinion here is the answer is no. And uh, as a matter of fact, um, I think the DNR will testify, at least they did last time, that there's about a 17 percent nonconformance rate with, uh, with the current laws about, um, you know, not having invasive species hanging on your boat trailer and in your uh, bilge of your boat, et cetera. Um, and, uh, you know, if we reflect upon that, um, there was one point at which, uh, you know, it was probably a 100% a violation rate, and uh, that would have been uh, before the law was passed, um, I would suspect. And so we're on a pretty good curve as we look at it, I think, uh, with uh, the efforts that have happened in Minnesota to let people know uh, that, um, uh, that, that it's in the best interest of them and, and the uh, resources of our state to uh, not leave the weeds hanging on the boat trailer. Um, and uh, I would suspect the answer, um, Representative Hansen, is one uh, that continues on some of those efforts that we have done. And uh, I know in the last committee, uh, one of the suggestions that was brought forward is, um, is kind of, uh, and, and maybe as a, as a novel idea and something, uh, certainly your committee is going to grapple with this, um, and that was um, uh, kind of a turn in poachers type of uh, uh, approach to uh, aquatic invasive species. And I would suggest uh, that if something like that happens, uh, you might couple it with uh, uh, an approach that I see happen in Ontario. You go into Ontario to some of these lakes and they've got these huge signs. I mean, they're like 20 feet tall and maybe 15 feet across. And they've, they've got all the fishing regulations are on there and a variety of other you know regulations are on there too it could easily you could easily make it very prominent on there that in place those signs only in front of the lakes um, that are inhabited with invasive species because that's where the, they're sourced from and that's where uh, the problem occurs um, and uh, and and just let people know that uh, there's invasive species in this particular lake and uh, you are required according to law to do this and uh, and by the way if uh, you see somebody who's not following that here's the phone number um, it could be something as simple as that focused on really the, the place that we need to focus on and that's those lakes where the, the problem already exists uh, rather than burdening everybody in such a broad sweeping way uh, as the current law does so um, anyway, those are my uh, opening thoughts on maybe s you guys are going to talk about this uh, a lot down the road, I, I expect. Thank you, Representative Draskowski. First, I'd like to hear from uh, Carol Austin. 
Carol, are you in the audience? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. If you could come forward. Carol, if you could identify yourself and who you represent and then give us your short testimony and we can see if we have any questions for you. Welcome. Good to see you again. Good morning. My name is Carol Austin and I'm the creator of the Facebook page pushing the repeal of this law. It really got the ball rolling and I have 3,450 likes on that page and many more followers <coughs> and they're all interested in just seeing the law thrown out. There's some people that say they could see some changes to it, but personally, I, I, as Representative Krasikowski said, it, it puts a burden and to me it says you're guilty before you're even accused of a crime. Okay. Requiring this sticker on a trailer saying, and as the number said, only 17% of the people aren't following the law and then the recent information from the Minnea Creek watershed, 43,000, over 43,000 inspections and they found 24 boats with zebra mussels on them. And I know from in Carver County, I'm on the Carver County Parks Commission and one day last summer there was eight boats from Lake Minnetonka and these are Lake Minnetonka residents that should know the law and should know better, <coughs> tried to put their boats into Lake Waconia with zebra mussels on the boats. These are boats that were sitting in Lake Minnetonka and loaded with zebra mussels. Now, how, how do you educate all those people? Is a sticker going to change their mind or attitude about it? I, I don't think so. I think maybe some stiffer penalties in other areas. And then what a lot of the people I've got liking the page have said is how do you stop the people that are moving docks and boat lifts and that from moving those from one lake to another and the DNR has said that that's the number one identified source of new infestations that they've found. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Austin? Thank you for your testimony. Next, uh, Mr. McElroy from the Hospitality Minnesota. Representative McElroy, welcome back. Good to see you. If you could identify yourself for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Dan McElroy. I'm Executive Vice President of the Minnesota Resort and Campground Association. We have 340 resort and campground members uh, all across the state who have, first of all, I want to talk about what they are doing or we are doing already on this important issue and express our concerns about the impact of this, particularly on guests considering uh, coming to Minnesota from other states and regions. My members care deeply about the health and the, the marketability of their lakes, the big investments that they hope to pass on uh, to future generations and their family, or that they depend on uh, for their retirement. They do not take this issue lightly at all. Uh, many of them have lake service provider licenses and continue to take lake service provider training, sometimes beyond that that's required and to train their employees uh, in the, uh, uh, the law and the techniques for preventing the further spread of aquatic invasive species. Most of our members have aquatic invasive species links on their websites. Many send printed material to guests, particularly those coming from out of state at the time of reservation. We're developing with our members a resort and campground best practices for things we can do to be helpful and we'll include those uh, online links, uh, educational programs at the resort, connections to our reservation, signage at uh, private boat landings. Many of our members have invested in the equipment to decontaminate boats. All of them have trained their um, dock boys and registration staff from the very smallest three, four, or five cabin resorts to large resorts because the consequences of not doing this well are as great for us as for anyone in the state. However, a significant number of our guests come from out of state. A significant number of our guests are in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. This uh, provision scares our out of state guests. News about it is being spread by competitors in Wisconsin, Michigan, upstate New York, to some extent, South Dakota. One of our members was at the Chicago Sports Show and had a tremendous number of uh, questions about this bill. <coughs> 
was asked if it was in fact true as he'd been told by a resort in Michigan that if he violated the bill he could go to jail or lose his vote. Obviously not true and kind of scare tactics, but one we're concerned about. One of my members in Itasca County is, uh, has had canceled, although I hope we're going to get it back depending on how this bill proceeds. A multi-cabin, multi-week booking worth more than $12,000 to an out-of-state uh, uh, per uh, guest, potential guest, who's concerned uh, they're chronologically gifted, meaning my age and older, uh, don't have a computer, have never tried to use a computer, we're told there is no paper bypass or not an easy paper bypass for this requirement, and they don't want to subject themselves to coming to Minnesota and risking breaking the law. Um, we are, um, we'd like to work with the DNR and others uh, to find more ways to educate the public. Uh, we think this provision has negative unintended consequences that are really severe and serious. In 1975, the um, University of Minnesota Extension Service published a report about the state of the resort industry at that time. In 19, and they estimate that in 1970, there were almost 2,600 resorts in Minnesota. Today there are 800. And making it more difficult for us to compete with resorts in other states doesn't make it more likely that we'll preserve that democratic access to Minnesota's uh, lakes and waters. When a resort is uh, sold for private use, we go from hundreds of families having access to the lake and its joys through a resort to the one family that may have bought a cabin or a resort uh, because that resort now had real estate more valuable than the business. This bill, uh, I'm afraid, may speed the process of reducing access to the lake. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to take questions if there are any. We want to be part of the solution. We don't think this is a very good part of a long-term solution. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. McElroy, I, McElroy, I just uh, had a quick question. As we're discussing different options uh, in how to deal with the trailer <coughs> decal issue, I was just curious if you guys have an opinion is it better for this to go away completely and never come back? Or could this come back in a different way without the same kinds of penalties and uh, expectations under the law? Mr. McElroy. Mr. Chairman, Representative Heinzman, if it came back principally involving in-state um, boat trailers, boats, guests, it would have less impact. And if it was connected to the registration of the trailer or the boat, so a part of that registration became taking an online quiz, we don't think it would scare away other guests. Um, we, we're not absolutely sure this, that there isn't a way to, to uh, make this workable. In its current form, it seems to be frightening guests and potential guests. Follow up, Representative Heisman? Okay. Uh, Mr. McQuarrie, I have a question for you. What if, um, what if the resorters had the opportunity to offer this quiz um, to their guests? Um, either electronically when they make a reservation or hard copy when they arrive? Mr. McElroy. Uh, that's uh, already an idea that we're pursuing. Thank you. That We think that's workable. It's the, when it becomes the potential gateway to committing a crime by not passing it, that we think is a problem. To offer it voluntarily is something I think will be part of our best practices for prevention. Mr. McElroy, maybe a tougher question. What if you were required to make your best effort to provide uh, it to the guests? Mandates uh, are a somewhat challenging. Uh, I'd be happy to discuss that with my members because I haven't presented that to the board or asked their opinion. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to duck, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I, I think that would be somewhat controversial. I'd certainly be willing to raise it with my members. Well, Mr. McElroy, you used to be a politician, so I'm not surprised that you're ducking and weaving. Um, any other questions for Mr. McElroy? Thank you. Uh, Representative Deal. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just really had a comment about how the mechanics of some of this, what that conversation was just about. <clears throat> In Ontario, every person that runs a boat is required to have a boater safety certificate, bar none. And um, so if you have one from your home state, you're good to go. But if you don't, which many of us older guys and gals don't, because we were born before the date that required it, you have to have it in order to run a boat on the lake in Ontario. And so um, <clears throat> I'm thinking about this. We, we took that document and uh, the test. It's about three minutes, essentially, 
four or five minutes for somebody that's never read anything like that, and we put it on our website. And they can print it off, and they can have it in their possession and come up there, and they get in and run in a boat. So the difference is here is that we want them to come and have their information before they get into the state, maybe, or when they're in the state that they can get the information. So it's going to be, you know, we've always talked about the department. I'm kind of asking a question here. We've always talked about the department having this on their website. Why wouldn't the tourist operators get the test and put it on their website so that the, you as a tourist operator or me, if I were in the U.S., say, you need to do this, I'll help you through it, it's on my website, click on it, fill it out, print it out, you're good to go, you don't have to have any more worries. This has worked really well, and they put the fear of God in, their, in the outfitters in Ontario when this first came out. And so I feel that same fear of God in my local resort communities at home. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Dill, Mr. <clears throat> we'd be willing to pursue that. As I said, I'd like to talk to members about it, but it, it may have some merit. Representative Dill, I'm glad I was in the bow of the boat and Representative Fabian was driving because we didn't remember the test. Well, <laughs> Representative Dill. Mr. Chairman, I, I thought that Fabian pa failed it. Well, <laughs> <laughs> to that point, Representative Dill, he may have failed the piloting test, but he didn't fail the fishing test That's because fair. in the last nine minutes before we, the float plane was to come to the dock, Fabian caught 11 fish and I caught one in the last nine minutes. So that's our plug for Thunderhook. Uh, um, okay, I think we're good to go, uh, Mr. McElroy. Thank you. Um, and members, that uh, Representative Dill has got a fishing camp in Ontario, so it's always good to get the international perspective. And uh, a couple of us were blessed to be able to go there a few years ago. So it's in fun that we mention it, but it was a truly awesome experience including Representative Fabian, the 45-inch northern that you caught after 45-inch? 47. 47-inch oh, nor northern that he caught after Representative Dill, the terrific net you had. I ended up with it in half of the net in each of my hands while Representative Fabian played the northern to the boat that actually wasn't even on the hook. It was the 16-inch walleye sideways in the mouth of the northern that Fabian, being the good fisherman, realized that the northern was on and that it probably had a walleye in its mouth, and we had to be careful bringing it up. So we've got some really cool pictures of that uh, <laughs> experience. So members, thank you for allowing me to di digress. Uh, back to a more serious uh, issue. Uh, Mr. Jacobs, uh, president of Rivertown Communication, uh, I believe you're next on the list. If you could come forward, thank you. Mr. Uh, Jacobs, yes. if you could identify yourself for the record and who you represent. Uh, certainly. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman and committee members. Uh, my name is Rob Jacobs, and I'm the president of Rivertown Communications. And under contract with the DNR, we've developed the training and the delivery system for the training that we're, we're discussing quite a bit these days. <clears throat> um, and I really just wanted to introduce my company uh, and our function in this um, uh, system. Um, we're um, a Stillwater-based company. We've been incorporated since 1991. We've been in Stillwater uh, since then. Uh, all of our employees are Minnesota residents. All of them are outdoors people and enjoy Minnesota lakes. Uh, there is one exception. We have our, one of our developers lives on the wrong side of the St. Croix in uh, St. Croix Falls. Um, but he enjoys the Minnesota rivers and lakes as well. Um, many of our customers are state of Minnesota departments, and we've worked with them for a number of years. We work with accessible training, um, special training, DHS, uh, several projects with the DNR. And um, we had a contract uh, with DNR that uh, was signed on March 3rd of 2014, just a little over a year ago. And the contract's not a a perpetual contract for our delivery of the system. It ends a, a year from now on March 3rd of 2016. And um, the functions that we've done on this uh, project are really uh, fourfold. Uh, we've developed the online training and the hard copy training in connection with the uh, DNR and their uh, subject matter experts. And under their direction and as a, a policy of our own, we've tried to make this training as complete as possible 
but also as non-intrusive to the people that have to take it. We understand <laughs> time is valuable and uh, a person can adequately go through this training in about 20 minutes uh, and that's both the online version or the hard copy version including the, the 10, uh, 10 question test. Um, we've developed a dedicated network to deliver this training and one of my worst nightmares was uh, speaking in front of a committee much like this uh, explaining why our network crashed when people wanted to take the training and get out and enjoy the, uh, the boating applications. Uh, so we've uh, developed a redundant network. Uh, we've load tested for 6,000 concurrent users, which was well in excess of what we're projecting for the usership. Uh, and if there are over 6,000 users that would hit this at one time, they're handed off to another secondary server to tell people that we're busy right now, but please come back. So uh, as near as we can guarantee it, we would not have a crash on this and people could be in and out of this training as quickly as possible. We also would provide the fulfillment service, which means when people take the training, uh, if it's a hard copy training, we do a manual scoring of their tests. And uh, if they're successful, they uh, get the decal. Uh, we mail the hard copy material out to them. Uh, that's all done through our office and we've set up the infrastructure, infrastructure to do that. Uh, we uh, are using a local printer, Ideal Printing, to do the fulfillment of the hard copy material. And uh, they would handle any of the, the high volume weeks where we would need to deliver a lot of the training materials. They do that uh, with their automatic systems. And finally, we'd provide the technical support for the people that would be taking this training should there be a problem uh, on logging in or where to go. Uh, there's nothing worse than having a problem with a computer program and nowhere to go. And we've got a, a system in place to handle uh, what we're projecting as well over our anticipated calls. Uh, we have uh, up, we, we're ready to add up to five technical support personnel to take phone calls. Uh, and we can uh, in, increase hours as needed to make sure that everybody would be, would be uh, handled. Um, now all of this training development has uh, taken place. Uh, it was done in December of 2014 in anticipation of the January 5th rollout. Uh, we got the call from DNR uh, uh, right before Christmas to put it on hold uh, until January 31st, which we did. Uh, we were able to stop the printing, so there's very little printing that's been done. Um, but other than that, it's on hold right now and it has been since the, uh, the end of uh, December. And uh, I don't know if you have the handout. I believe that it was in your packets. There's some other issues that we've heard uh, questions about the program that have been addressed. And rather than take your time, I thought you could just read the, the handout material. Um, I should have uh, contact information on there too. I'm, uh, very open to talking with anybody about this program, at least from the logistical standpoint, so not on the policy level. Mr. Jacobs, we have a one-page <coughs> handout at the top. It says Rivertown Communication, Inc., and it does have uh, contact information for yourself and a phone number at the bottom, and I believe it addresses those questions. So yes, sir, you, you, don't, you don't need to go over them. Thank you for doing that to yeah. keep it. Short. Do you have any other wrap-up comments? And I can see if there's any questions for you, um, Mr. Jacobs. Uh, sure. The only thing that I, I do want to add is that I hope this is allowed to proceed in some form and we're ready to, to talk to the DNR about any modifications that are needed in the delivery. But education works. And the reason we put the quiz in there is because people pay more attention to content when they know they're going to be quizzed on it at the end. So there is a reason to that. It's not a hard quiz. but. Education does work, and um, our lakes are worth the protecting, and we just hope that, um, that it's allowed to proceed. We've taken about 2,000 calls from people. We're supporting the line right now, and most of them wish they didn't have to take it, but almost all of them understand the reason that they need to, and they're willing to invest the 20 minutes to, uh, to learn uh, what they need to. So with that, I'll end, and, um, and any questions? Are Mr. Jacobs, I, I do have one question for you. Yes. Um, and uh, the DNR will be coming down after you we have one testifier before the DNR. But we have a fiscal note from the DNR um, that looks like 
Um, right now, uh, DNR is estimating, um, if Representative Drazkowski's bill was to pass, that uh, DNR feels they have an obligation to your firm. Um, have you seen the fiscal note and the amount on the fiscal note? I haven't seen the, the amount. I know we've been talking for the last uh, several weeks about that. And um, depending on different scenarios, what, what are the scenarios for obligations by the DNR, would you say monetarily, or are you not willing to divulge that at this point in time? Um, if it's okay with the, the DNR, I'm, I'm willing to, to would bring that up. Um, well, I guess I'm asking you to because uh, this is the sure. finance committee and I want to know what we're going to be on the hook for. So yeah. unless you, if you don't want to do it, I'll, I can talk later. But I think it would be appropriate for you to get, at least give us a range of potentially <laughs> what uh, we might be on the hook for based on the contract that you have signed with the DNR and the different scenarios that could unfold. Right. Currently, um, we've got in direct costs, which are most most of the, the total is a direct direct cost for the development, uh, the infrastructure that we've added specifically for this program, and the contracts that we've signed. Uh, for example, you need to sign a long-term server contract. Uh, for the length of the anticipated contract, uh, we're just under $330,000. Okay, that's consistent with the fiscal note. Thank you. Okay. To this point, Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I was just going to say if they were in current negotiations on or billing wasn't complete, I think for the record we should know it. it no. That may not be the total amount if there's other cost of shutdown and those type of things. I do have a question on another point. Go ahead, Representative Hansen. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. And I want to go back to kind of validation. Uh, mm -hmm. in terms of how how you validated the uh, quality is not the right word but uh, did you use focus groups did you on the questions that are there did you be did you uh, do uh, testing with groups in terms of ease of, of uh, usage uh, content retention uh, some of the normal uh, effective effectiveness measures before you went live Certainly. Um, yes, usability is a big... Mr. Jacobs, go ahead. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, you just say Chair Representative Hanson. If you don't know his name, you can say Chair Representative. Okay, Chair uh, Representative Hanson. Uh, certainly, we have done usability testing on the, uh, the mechanics <coughs> of the quiz. Uh, we've done uh, technical and mechanical reviews of the questions, and that primarily involves making sure that anything that's asked was presented in the training. Uh, we did have one slip through that there was a question that wasn't addressed in the training, so we modified that. And your copy reflects that that modification. Uh, we have had uh, a number of users go through it, uh, including the tests and comment on it. And everybody that's gone through the training has said that they thought they knew everything, but they always picked up one or two items in there. Uh, and in the tests were passed in every case uh, that we've we've tested. Uh, and I don't have the, the, the numbers on that, but it was significant both within our organization and the DNR uh, had done the, the testing as well. Follow up, Representative Hanson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And in general, when we have this type of testing, uh, is there better retention than when we're just printing thousands of brochures or putting up signs and relying on uh, passive distribution of information? Mr. Uh, Jacobs. Yes, yes Chair, uh, Representative Hanson. Yes, it certainly is. Uh, and the main reason for that is that when you uh, know that you're going to be asked to test or qu test questions following what you read, you're going to pay closer attention to the to the test than just the brochure. Um, I've got a lot of brochures in my car that I glance at headlines and then they sit there. Thank you. Representative Fabian. Are you done? Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Jacobs, I'm curious, within the system, if you're a multiple boat a trailer owner, how do you... After you've, if you've taken, when you've taken the test, how do you get multiple stickers if that was to be the case? Mr. Jacobs, and if that's a question for the DNR, they're coming up later, but if you know the answer, go ahead. Mr. Jacobs. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, Chair, Mr. <coughs> Representative. Um, uh, the um, facility to handle that right now is that if you do pass the test, uh, you can order additional stickers uh, up to five without a phone call if they have more than five, a need for more than five. They can call and uh, request more. We, and we do have live operators to take that call. 
Um, and then we would ask why they need more than five. It's just an arbitrary number. <clears throat> Mr. Jacobs, when they ask for up to five, do they acknowledge that those are actually trailers they own and they're not for their friends? Is there just a, or is that an assumption you make? That is on the uh, order form that we that those are uh, available for their own uh, personal trailers. Follow up, Representative Fabian. I, I'm good, thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Jacobs, for coming forward. And if, it might be great if you could hang around till the bill is done, in case uh, after uh, the other testifiers and the DNR comes up, if you could be available. I think we'll be wrapped up here within 10 minutes. Yes, um, thank, thank you. you for your time. Yeah, thank you for coming down. Um, next is Sherry Davis White, uh, president of the Minnehaha Creek Watershed District. Ms. White, if you could come forward, if you could identify yourself for the record and who you represent and give us your short testimony, then we can uh, get the DNR down here also. Welcome, good morning. Um, Chair McNamara, thank you. Um, members. We thank you for the opportunity to speak to the committee. As if you could tell us who you are and who you represent, thank you. thank you. My name is Sherry Davis White. I'm president of the Minnehaha Creek Watershed District Board of Managers. Thank you. We are um, <coughs> happy to be here today as the committee considers House File 184. We are also interested in House File 1065, <coughs> both of which relate to the statutes regarding the establishment of the Aquatic Invasive Species Prevention Program. The Minnehaha Wat Creek Watershed District, MCWD, is a special unit of government. Our watershed in Hennepin and Carver counties has 129 lakes, including Lake Minnetonka. MCWD views the spread of aquatic invasive species, or AIS, as a critical issue for our watershed and for Minnesota. We have adopted and are implementing an AIS management program within our jurisdiction in close collaboration with anglers, lakeshore property owners, marina operators, boat manufacturers, and other citizens, as well as other local units of government and the State Department of Natural Resources. We recognize the grave threat AIS posed to the health and recreational value of our lakes and streams, and the serious potential impact AIS present to property values and our economy. Our goal in AIS management is to prevent the introduction of new AIS in water bodies in our district while maintaining access to those waters. As we have learned from developing our own AIS program and working with many partners, there is no silver bullet in efforts to prevent AIS or remove them when they have been introduced. Some combination of education, prevention, intervention, and enforcement is needed. The AIS prevention program is a concept that we have supported. It has a broad reach to increase public awareness of AIS through education and ease of enforcement. It is another tool we have been awaiting to put in the public toolbox to strengthen efforts to prevent the spread of AIS. The program was delayed in 2013 and it appears for 2015. We are confident that the law can be amended to accomplish its goals. That is why we submitted comments to the House Mining and Outdoor Recreation Committee on February 10th to oppose House File 184, which would repeal the program. We testified at the Senate Environment and Energy Committee on February 17th in support of amendments to the program in Senate File 669, which began as the companion to House File 1065. The amendments proposed in House File 1065 and Senate File 669 are on track to make the program more workable. Any new initiative is likely to have imperfections when it is rolled out and experience will lead to changes that will make it run more smoothly. We will be supportive of amendments now and in the future that will make the program more successful in its acceptance by the public and in its effectiveness in slowing and stopping the spread of AIS. One of the constant themes we heard during the development of our AIS management program and one we continue to hear from residents in our district who are concerned about AIS is that the penalties and sanctions for breaking AIS regulations are too small. They are not meaningful enough to gain significant <coughs> and immediate compliance. The warning and $25 civil fine appear to be just a slap on the wrist and hardly in proportion with actions that would disrupt the ecosystem of a water body or a watershed. We don't know exactly what the amount for the fine should be, 
but encourage you to consider something that will grab the people's attention. Ms. White, I'm, I'm just going to ask you, because I know you have multiple pages there, and I know you testified in the Mining Committee. Can you, can you wrap up? Is there some key points here? Because I noticed it's multiple pages printed on both sides of a small print. So <laughs> okay. if you don't mind wrapping it up, that would be Certainly. terrific. Um, we are very and if, interested. And if you could also provide it electronically to our committee, we'll get it to all the members. But please Certainly. continue. We are very interested in seeing that trailer-borne infestations of AIS are dealt with in this law, and we um, would work toward the common goal of, of protecting all the resources of the state for our future generations. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your, your work on behalf of the Watershed District. I appreciate that. Any questions for Ms. White? Thank you for your testimony, and thank you for coming back again and <laughs> testifying before the House. Uh, Mr. Meyer, if you could come forward. <clears throat> Mr. Meyer, you, you might be one that I, I, I don't know how you want to testify in regards to talking about the two different bills. You're the last testifier on House File 184, and you're the first on 1065. So I guess if you want to kind of do this part here, and then what I'd like to give Representative Draskowski an opportunity to wrap up, and then we'll lay his bill over, and then we'll bring Representative Euglum forward, and you can just stay there. Welcome, Commissioner Meyer, if you could identify yourself for the Mr. record. Mr. Chairman, members for the record, Bob Meyer, Assistant Commissioner with the Department of Natural Resources. I'm just going to keep my testimony very brief. We believe this program can have a positive impact on reducing the rate of violations within, with the AIS transport and contamination of the lakes. We do not support the repeal, and we support the Euglum bill, which we'll testify next to, to, to improve that and make it more user-friendly to address the concerns that we've heard previous, in previous hearings. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Meyer. Uh, questions for Commissioner Meyer related to the repeal? Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Commissioner Meyer, I think when uh, Commissioner Landwehr was here, we asked similar questions. And the DNR uh, this year has been fairly consistent on mend it, don't end it. Is that correct? Mr. Commissioner Chair, Meyer. Members, that's correct. Thank you. Representative Draskowski, you want to give us your wrap up? Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. Um, uh, good discussion on the bill, um, but uh, you know we uh, we still are faced with a uh, law that doesn't work. And um, if uh, this law stays in statute, is not repealed, Mr. Chair, um, the DNR is going to be required under law to carry it out. And so um, uh, I would urge members of this committee, as you deliberate further upon this issue, to include in your solution repealing the law that's in place and come forward with a solution that works. Um, some other elements that really weren't brought up in testimony that were in Representative Hackbar's committee, uh, there's questions about the Data Practices Act and its relationship to the decals on the boats uh, that was brought up as an issue. Uh, the DNR testified that uh, I believe uh, about half of the boats in Minnesota have trailers and the other half don't. Uh, we've got John boats, rice boats, canoes, and others. Um, so that uh, uh, shows more of the unworkability of the current law. Uh, the, uh, the kids of owners, the children, are they required to take the test or not? And what if someone else operates or borrows your boat? And how does that work uh, into the current law and the uh, consequences uh, with that law? So um, I would just uh, encourage you to uh, uh, include in your solution uh, removing this law from the statutes and uh, coming forward with something that is not uh, as burdensome on the people of Minnesota, is not as um, <coughs> uncertain in its, um, uh, in its definition and in its uh, uh, language um, as we go forward. Uh, one question real quickly, and I'm, I, I'm not going to you know, suggest or, or request an answer, but um, as we look at um, the uncertainty of this, um, we look at number two on the, uh, the quiz. Uh, AIS currently in Minnesota cannot move overland without help from people. Now, as somebody reads that, um, you know, I mean, uh, technically, uh, I would guess, uh, or the DNR is probably going to say that that's technically true. Uh, I would think that as people read that, the uncertainty of that, as you look at birds and geese and other things that trans <coughs> transport uh, um, these species, um, just questions arise, Mr. Chair. So. Uh more Representative under. Draskowski, for members, Representative Draskowski, is, there's the 10 question that we have uh, that was provided by the DNR. Um, 
that Mr. Jacobs has developed, the 10 questions. Uh, you question number two. I have a question mark, Representative Draskowski, by number two like you, because I don't think it's technically correct. I have a question mark on number six and number 10. So I, I think uh, I personally am not necessarily like you 100% in agreement that those 10 questions are 100% factually accurate. And whenever we put some question in what we're doing, I think it gives the public of potential for, for distrust. I'm going to go to one question from Representative Hansen and one from ha Representative Hackbart, and then we are going to move to Representative Uglum's bill. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Representative Draskowski, you mentioned the law was unworkable, but it hasn't been implemented yet. How can it be unworkable if it hasn't been implemented? Representative Draskowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, <coughs> Representative um, Hansen, it's, uh, it's unworkable in uh, the way that it's presented. Um, you know, uh, we talked about the fact that, uh, and I mentioned, uh, half the boats in, in Minnesota don't have trailers. I mean, it begins there. Uh, people driving from Wisconsin to South Dakota with their boat have to, uh, uh, have to comply with this law and uh, may not even know of the existence of the law as they simply just drive through our state. Um, the questions about uh, children or other people driving the boat are all uh, questions um, uh, that uh, that come to mind, but uh, uh, representative, the, the people of Minnesota um, are are unaccepting of this um, level or degree of um, of movement in in a law that that places these extra re burdensome requirements on them. They they they're, they're putting decals on their boats. They're buying licenses. Uh, already, uh, they're following uh, many laws. They they are required to not have their boat plug in their boat, even if it's sitting in their garage over winter, uh, and they happen to haul it to the first lake of the year. They're in violation of the law. There's a variety of other laws that we placed in the statute, 2012, and representative. We've just piled too many things onto uh, the heap of laws around this particular area uh, that it has become uh, unworkable for the people of Minnesota. Representative Hackbarth. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, Representative Draskowski is right. I mean, when we talk about unworkable, there's a number of different issues that were not addressed in this law, and uh, I do support something else, but uh, we, I, we do need to repeal this because this is not working. This is not going to be able to work. Um, we heard testimony that uh, you can get up to five stickers. Uh, I own one boat. I can get five stickers. I can give them to my friends so they don't have to take the course. But this committee is about the finance issue of what this is all about. Uh, we heard all this uh, policy stuff in uh, the uh, Mining and Outdoor Recreation Committee um, where it's not how it's not going to work. But I got, it, got here a little late, so I don't know if you touched on this issue, but uh, this, is, this course is going to cost $5 to take this course. Um, the question is that $5, and I think the people of the state of Minnesota think that that money's going to the DNR. That money's not going to the DNR. It's going to the vendor. I'm not sure that, uh, that the vendor is authorized to collect that $5. That's a problem, and that, I don't know that that was addressed. Um, this is a huge mistake that was made by this legislature and probably by the DNR uh, to let this pass into law. Uh, I think we should want to get rid of this law, start over, come up with something that's going to work. Uh, in 2011, there was a law passed in similar to this that we all agreed that no, that's not going to work. So then we came back in 2012 with another law, and this is it. And now we're discovering that that's not going to work. We had an effective date of July of 2015 uh, to extend it out to make sure that this was gonna, going to work. Nothing was done in that regard to make sure that this was going to work. We're finding out now it's not going to work. So we have to repeal that. Let's repeal that. I don't know if Rep uh, Representative Uglum's bill is going to work or not. We'll look at that and we'll hear the testimony on that. Maybe that will fix it. I don't think so. From when I look at the bill, I don't think that takes care of a number of the issues. But we can come up with something else uh, to educate people on this issue. That's okay, and I'm okay with that. But this does not work. It's got a number of different issues. The DNR should want this repealed. This legislature should want this repealed, and we can start with something else. Thank you, Representative Hackbart, for those comments. Representative Draskowski. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, if I could just briefly. Um, 
Go ahead. Taking on to what um, Representative Hackbarth was talking about, I'm glad he mentioned the fees because uh, I did some looking into this and, and there is some problems about this. Uh, there's nowhere in um, Section 86B.13, that author, which is the um, statute, that, the section of law that, uh, that authorized this, um, there's nowhere in there suggesting that the DNR is authorized to collect a fee or an agent of the DNR is collected to offer, uh, uh, collect a f authorized to collect a fee. As a matter of fact, Mr. Chair and members, uh, Section 16A.1283 uh, says, notwithstanding any law to the contrary, an executive branch state agency may not impose a new fee or increase an existing fee unless the new fee or increase is approved by law. Thank you, Representative Draskowski. Mr. Chair, um, the, the DNR is in violation of state law. Well, Representative Draskowski, I appreciate your opinion on that. I'll remind members that 86B.13 subdivision 3 reads, and this is the law that passed in 2012 that I authored, um, contracting for services. The commissioner may contract for services to provide training and testing services under this section. That is in law. You and Representative Hackbarth raised great questions of whether what took place is consistent with that law or not, and that's why we're here today having this discussion. Clearly what was intended in law in 2012 is not going to work, and we got to figure out something that will work. So Representative Draskowski, thank you for bringing this bill forward, and House File 184 is laid over for possible inclusion. Representative Uglum, if you Thank you, Mr. Would, Chair. Yeah, thank you, Representative Draskowski. Uh, Rep Representative Uglum, if you want to bring forward uh, House File 1065. Representative Uglum moves House File 1065 for possible inclusion uh, to be laid over. Representative Uglum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Did, did you want to talk about the, uh, the lead all? I want to talk about whatever goes fast. Representative Uglum. <laughs> all right. Representative Uglum, you know what you need to do? You need to move your DE1 amendment to get the bill in the shape the author would like. Uh, members, is it, does anybody have any discussion to the DE1? Uh, it would make more sense to get that amendment moved so we can actually talk about the bill Representative Uglum wants. Hanson to the DE1. Representative Hanson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and, and Representative Uglum. I, uh, we, I'm a co-author on the original bill and just was you know, last night we all were at the Regents and this amendment got posted, I think, at 6 p.m. So there wasn't a lot of time to look at. I think, Mr. Chair, you'd referenced it. I'm just, you know, I think we've been working well. I, I wish we would have had a chance to maybe a little more lead time to look at it overnight. I'm not being critical there, Mr. Chair, but I, it, it just, uh, we were on the floor a long time last night. Yeah. And uh, it, if maybe in the future a little more heads up with the actual bill would be good. Thank you. A point well made, Representative Hansen, and we are just laying the bill over, and that's why uh, this amendment is certainly in order, and it met the deadline requirements. Uh, further discussion to the DE1? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Uh, the amendment's uh, adopted. Um, Representative Uglum, do you want do you want to speak to the uh, to your DE1 or the to your 1065 as amended with the DE1 and then Mr. Meyer can walk through it also. Representative Uglum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, good morning, committee members, and 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 all of you know that I, I I'm very concerned about AIS and the effect on our lakes and uh, our way of Minnesota life. Uh, to the DE1, uh, the DE1 puts the bill in the uh, essentially the same form as the uh, Senate author, uh, Senator Sexhawk has. Uh, and this bill is a good faith effort to uh, address a number of the concerns that we've just heard in terms of cost, in terms of making this a much more customer friendly a much more uh, easily uh, enforceable bill. Uh, it, uh, it has no costs to the individuals. And uh, these, the fines are extremely minimal. Uh, the test itself, uh, 20 minutes to save a lake, uh, to save, to save uh, all of our lakes, uh, I don't think is, is too much to, to deal with. Uh, there is no cost to the decal in this bill. And the, um, uh, as far as trailering goes, this bill has changed and, and uh, uh, 
Director Myers will get into it. This bill has changed where if you are a Wisconsin resident and you're going to North Dakota to go fishing and you're trailering through the state, there is no penalty, there is no problem. So um, uh, we have narrowed that requirement and we've pushed this thing back so we can provide this education uh, and so everybody can understand uh, what's required. Um, if there's no questions, I'll defer. Mr. Meyer. Mr. Meyer. Mr. Chairman, members, thank you and thank you, Representative Uglum, for trying to help us resolve this issue. This, the amendment before you today has, has come about based upon the discussions that did occur in the Mining and Recreation Policy or Subcommittee or Policy Committee, um, and we're trying to work with stakeholders to address all of the concerns that were raised. I think starting on Subdivision 4, um, the program is clarify that it is not for transporting, it's only for launching watercraft into waters of the state as defined in 84D. And then it also provides that a person can, needs to have the decal or tr a training validation issued under this section. So uh, the next line there, temporary authorizations valid for 14 days can be requested for persons that have not completed the requirements of this course to help ease the burden, so to speak, on residents or non-residents coming into the state to go to a resort or a campground to go hunting or fishing within the, the state. You can see on that it continues that they're valid for three years as in current law. The next big change is, begins on line 3.13. So we talked about the, there's an exemption. If a person, uh, person is exempted from the training and decal requirements if they hold a valid lake server provider training certificate or if they're using their boat to launch water or water-related equipment that has been stored basically on their shoreline. So we provided an exemption in, in 84D for a person. If you live on Lake Minnetonka, for example, and you're pulling your dock out of the water and it's covered with zebra mussels, it used to be against the law to put that back into <coughs> the same body of water. So we clarified that several years ago to say that if you're pulling equipment out of an infested water body, you can put it back into that same infested water body the next spring. So what this section does, it says if you're using that trailer like many people do around the lake states, lake area, to pull your pontoon boat out of the lake in the fall and to put it back in in the spring, you don't need the decal. In essence, what it says is that the decal is only needed to launch a boat <coughs> off of a trailer into a public water body. So we've clarified that and I think that's a big clarification point. The other piece that's there, people said, well, there's no penalty. People won't be following it. What we've done is created a $25 civil citation after the first year. So section seven says, a person wa launching water-related equipment in the waters of the state who failed to display the sticker um, are subject to a, a violation after the first year. So the violation doesn't occur until 2017. The other important part of this, that it delays the effective date of the decal training until next January. So if this law sure would to pass, we will be very proactive, working with all sorts of media opportunities and our partners with Explore Minnesota Tourism, Resort Campground Association, the media, to make sure that people know there is no decal needed this year, but starting next January, the training will be needed. We'll go through the, se the sports show season, uh, working at all these shows and, and opportunities to educate people on that. Now, if you... Yeah, that was that season, the trailer going back and forth. Seasonally launching, stored, or repairing water. So making sure that, as we discussed, you do not need the decal if your trailer, for example, my neighbors have a trailer they use with their pontoon boat to pull their boat in and out of the lake for storage. They don't go anywhere. The boat stays on their shoreline. They aren't launching anywhere. So they're exempt from that requirement. Or if you were just to use your boat to do that, to go in that same spot or your dock, you don't need the trailers there. The next changes that occur just on the, so then I guess it'd probably be easiest to go back to the front of the, the amendment, which establishes that civil penalty. You can see on line 1.22, says that for launching water-related equipment into waters of the state, it's a $25 civil citation. On page two of the bill, uh, it talks about that delayed effective date, that that section is effective January 1st, 2017, and applies to violations that occur after that date. Uh, the next piece talks about what we had in statute training for offenders. Uh, if violations that occur after January 1st, 2016, the person would need to take the training course and that would be effective following enactment. And then I think one of the bigger, most important things lies in section three that states the commissioner shall not charge a fee for a person taking the course. And 
Representative McNamara, I appreciate the discussion that we had about the contracting language because at the time when this provision was passed into law, we were very open and, and upfront with the legislature about our intentions and that's why that language was there, that we would seek out a private vendor who may charge a fee to cover their costs. And I appreciate the discussion with Mr. Jacobs as well because we need to make sure that he is compensated for the work that he's done. And those are conversations that need to take place as this bill is progressing as well. So we're clarifying that there is no fee for the program. The DNR will use our aquatic invasive species funding to pay for that program and the decals. Again, uh, section four talks about the violation after 2016, so it kicks it out another year. And then uh, the section five deals with that at no cost to the person, the decal. So it clarifies again that there is no cost. Mr. Chairman, that is the, the essence of the amendment. Okay, here's what my plan is, Mr. Meyer, uh, Commissioner Meyer. Um, I and other members have a number of questions about this as it being the final solution. I think it still needs uh, much more work. Um, uh, much of it centered around uh, the requirement or it being voluntary. Uh, that's a big discussion that's not going to happen today. That discussion will be farther down the road as this bill comes back for further discussion. But I do want members, if they could uh, narrow their focus down to the questions in the delete all amendment mm -hmm. that we've adopted, which is now the bill that Representative Uglum is proposing, your questions to Commissioner Meyer so we can continue to move this discussion forward. Representative Fabian. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. It's not exactly on the bill, so if you want me, I'll wait. I just wanted some clarification. Go ahead, um, Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Commissioner Meyer, uh, with regards to uh, Rivertown Communications and uh, the costs that are being, that have been incurred, uh, as we sit today, are there costs that are continuing to be incurred in addition to where we are today? Is the state going to be on the hook for more costs uh, at the end of this month as a result of the work that Rivertown is doing, or is that clock kind of stopped where we are right now? Uh, Commissioner Meyer um, and Representative Fabian, and to Representative Hansen's point earlier, I want to be real careful um, uh, that I don't want to get in the middle of uh, what could move from a legislative to a legal issue. Uh, so feel free to answer the question and just be conscious of where we're going. Commissioner Meyer. Mr. Chairman, thank you for that comment. There are small costs that are still being incurred and currently at this point in time we are in con con consultation with Mr. Jacobs about canceling that contract and the costs that are associated which I need to circle back with the chairman and make sure that they're okay with us paying, canceling that contract and, and paying him out out of this fiscal year's appropriation. And Commissioner Meyer, uh, Representative Hansen uh, needs to be part of those discussions too. Yes, sir. Representative Fabian, any additional follow-up? Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And on, on that point, if we are going to be, this was maybe a question for you, um, this being a fiscal committee, would uh, expenditures come from the Game and Fish Fund if we need to, I mean, are we going to need to put an appropriation in um, at some point uh, on this bill? Do we need a fiscal note? Uh, I mean, we have the fiscal note, but are we going to need to actually appropriate Game and Fish or another fund to cover this? Representative Hansen, that's going to depend on where we end up and what uh, ends up the relationship, if any, between uh, the state of Minnesota and uh, Mr. Jacobs' firm in, in what we do going forward. So those discussions probably shouldn't go any far. I mean, uh, those discussions we don't know until we probably get this bill in the shape that we think uh, we propose. Then we'll know better how to deal and where those funds do come from. and. Uh, where they'll actually come from will be dependent on what our final solution is. Mm -hmm. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Commissioner Meyer, I'm, I'm a little concerned, you know, considering what we've done in the past with AIS, and it was referenced earlier, we start a program, we stop it. I, I think you have a large amount of stickers from a previous program in some warehouse, warehouse somewhere from a previous attempt on this, and I'm concerned if we stop action on this for two years or have to restart it if we have a sound valid program for education to keep to put it live during 2015 so that Minnesotans who want to take the test and I think there are more out there than people are giving Minnesotans credit for 
people who want to take the test could take the test and uh, do that during 2015 and that you could promote it and education does work rather than throwing the brakes on again uh, uh, having the money that's been appropriated sit there uh, lost and then we have to restart again and the years go by and the critters keep coming so I would encourage that we keep moving forward put turn it on and let uh, Minnesotans if they want to participate in that and I realize that'll cost money but it's a small price to pay if people come into the system and want to get uh, educated about how they can do things um, rather than stopping and waiting again and then <coughs> two years from now we have another hearing like this where somebody's upset and we have to throw the brakes on again and we we keep waiting stop start stop start so I would encourage you to turn it on uh, work on the voluntary effort uh, even if these uh, uh, extensions go out for effectiveness Thank you for those comments, Representative Hansen. And it's certainly my hope that we don't do nothing for the foreseeable future, uh, but we have to find something that's workable in the short term uh, and workable in the long term. So we're going to have good discussions about those. Um, Representative Newberger. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. This question is for uh, the commissioner. Uh, I'm pretty new to this whole process with this committee and, I, and I'm finding it to be pretty eye-opening and uh, I just was curious uh, if you would uh, bring me up to speed is as far as any impl uh, impl implications or, uh, or um, logistical issues or cost related issues to non-English speaking people that use our our lakes <clears throat> I mean we have a, a large population of Spanish speaking people Hmong speaking people uh, go on down the line and when you go out to use our lakes uh, it, they're frequently used by all Minnesotans um, uh, so has the language barrier been something that's been factored into this equation <coughs> could you just bring me up to speed on this and and if not is that a, is that a cost that we're not looking at mr. Meyer if, if you're not fully aware of what that program is maybe we can get that information from mr. Jacobs and provide it to the uh, committee mr. Meyer Chairman, I believe that it is available in Spanish now Hmong would be another option that we will need to look at but I, I, we would have to look at that as well so and it looks like uh, Commissioner Meyer that it's not available currently in Hmong is it available in Spanish it is not okay so we'll have that discussion going forward about the need for that but currently it's not available in any language other than English uh, and it's on hold as we all know right now representative Hackbar well thank you mr. chairman and uh, Rep representative you uh, your bill doesn't address uh, deleting the current law we have a current law that's going to take effect July 1st this bill doesn't address that issue doesn't change that law so I, I, I would encourage you if you're going to move forward with this at least you have to d delete the current law that we have on the books uh, this bill does not address that I think maybe this was put together assuming that we're going to do the Draskowski bill and get rid of that law I think that might be where you're going with this legislation if not you're gonna to have to include that uh, in order to uh, make this bill work um, but this this doesn't address some of the other issues that we talked about uh, this bill was in my committee and I moved it to this committee uh, I allowed that to happen uh, without discussing some of the policy changes and I think some of those things should be talked about as well as if we're gonna look at this bill uh, we talked about uh, you're, you're able to get five stickers right now this doesn't address that doesn't say anything of, that you that you can't I take the test and I can get up to five stickers I can give those out to my friends if I only own one boat how do you how do you deal with that issue we're not addressing that uh, how do you deal with the issue that uh, uh, my kids and, and their friends come and take my boat and use my boat they don't have I take the test I get the sticker I put it on my trailer and they go and uh, take my boat to various lakes and they don't have a clue about what this education issue is they didn't have to take the test that's another issue uh, we still don't address uh, anything in the bill about uh, the cost. Uh, it doesn't say anything about uh, how, how the vendor is going to get compensated. Um, it says that the commissioner is not going to uh, charge a fee. That means that there's not going to be any 
fee charged by the DNR, but it still doesn't say that the vendor can't collect a fee because we still have that issue. So there's a number of issues that are not addressed in this bill, so I, I agree that uh, uh, it might be a work in progress, but this is not the answer. Thank you. Representative Eugla. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative, uh, I, I agree. I mean, this, this, is, uh, this is a bill that we've been kicking around on this committee for the last couple of years. You know that. Um, with regard to, to uh, the issue of about five stickers and things like that, I mean, right now, today, uh, you may have gun safety training and you may allow your kid who doesn't have gun safety training to take your gun. And I don't know how we're ever going to uh, address some of those issues like that. Issue. Part, of it is, part, of it is, part of it is really um, <coughs> the, the idea that this is an educational bill. This is what we're trying to do. We're trying to make everybody understand that 20% noncompliance on uh, boat checks around the state is not acceptable. And we're trying to make this as easy as possible for people to learn about this and to comply. Um, you know, I'd like to make it voluntary, but I'd like to have voluntary speed limits too, you know, and it just doesn't work. So um, I agree, and we, we can look at this some more. Uh, perhaps Ms. Taylor uh, could, talk a little bit about uh, the idea that um, uh, some of the issues about uh, the old bill versus the new bill, or Denny could too, uh, but. Representative Hackbarth, follow up. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Well, Representative Eugle, then you're not open to the idea of making it uh, voluntary. Mr. Chair. Representative Eugle. Representative Hackbarth. Uh, no, I'm not. Representative Hackbarth. Thank you. Um, uh, next, I'd like to br bring down uh, uh, two other testifiers to this bill. Mr. Hansen, Kurt Hansen, are you in the audience? Yes. Please come forward. Thank you. And then, Mr. Forrester, I've got you next on the list. Mr. Chairman, if I just may for Go one ahead. second. Commissioner Meyer. We did provide a reference table for you to look at that does outline where Minnesota is with our AIS laws compared to other states. Just for your reference, I didn't get a chance to go into it, but I think it's something you may want to keep in your folders and refer back to. So thank you. Thank, thank you, Commissioner Meyer. Um, uh, Mr. Forrester, I think Mr. Hansen is first. Mr. Hansen, please come forward. Identify yourself for the, who, for the record and who, if anybody else, represent other than yourself. Uh, my name is Kurt Hansen. I'm a resident. I guess uh, <coughs> uh, representing uh, other residents that aren't uh, speaking right now. I've got a few points. Uh, Welcome, go ahead. Thank you. I got a few points here. I get a couple of questions here. Um, as far as the, uh, uh, the repertorian property um, being exempt, um, they say this bill is supposed to be educational. How many boats are on repertorian property? And why are these people being exempt? Isn't this a good opportunity to, to give them the ed education? Another question is, are, do all repairing property owners keep their boat on the lift? Do they transport that boat from, from, one, from that lake to another, another lake? I think they do. I know a lot of people that come to, to the river I live on, St. Croix River. I know a lot of people from Minnetonka take their boats out of the lake go into Wisconsin, launch their boat in Wisconsin on the, on the, on the St. Croix River, then they go back to Minnetonka. Now, legally, they can... Mr. Hansen, I just want to clarify, those people are not exempt under the proposal. They would be subjected. If they have a trailer and they move it from one body of water to another, they would be subjected to the law. So go ahead, continue with your testimony. Yeah, I understand I what you're saying. I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah, but they're, they're, they're not exempt for transporting their boat from to Wisconsin, right? What is, I guess, uh, see this is where the law, law is confusing to me, and this is why the law is faulty. There's too many, too many holes in it. I mean, so. Mr. Hansen, you're one of only six million Minnesotans that are confused by this bill. Yeah, then that, that's why the, I, I feel this law should be repealed and started, start from scratch and ha have it done right instead of keep kind of fixing it and adding more loopholes, or not loopholes, more holes into the law that we already have. Well, thank this you for your testimony. Do you have anything else you'd like to add? Yes, I got another, uh, another one. Um, they say there's no fee. There is a fee. 
who's going to pay for it? The DNR just said they, they're going to take it out of the AIS fee. Now, the last committee meeting, they just said that the, their funding, their, they, they have to take $250,000 out of the general fund to, to, to subsidize the AIS the, the functions. Now, I think I heard that it was going to cost $300,000 a year for this program, so that we're adding another three hundred thousand dollars for the AIS uh, fee program. So, so I think that we we see another fee coming down the line, or I see a fee another fee coming down the line to, that have to supplement what's what they're adding on to it. And another point, they say it's um, it's a twenty five dollar <coughs> fine. Well, a seatbelt a lot. The seatbelt ticket is, I think, twenty-five dollar or fifty dollar fine, but with all the court fees and everything, it comes up to over a hundred, hundred some dollars. So it's not just twenty-five dollars fine. Thank, thank you for coming forward, Mr. Hanson. I okay. appreciate it. Any questions? Thank you, and I appreciate you coming forward and, and raising those concerns. They're legitimate concerns. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Forrester. Welcome. If you could identify yourself for the record and who you represent, I'm going to ask you to keep it short. I've got seven testifiers on a bill that was never heard in a House committee and they need to all testify today on uh, Representative Draskowski's other uh, bill that's gonna have an informational hearing. So Mr. Forrester, if you wanna give us your comments and I'm gonna ask Mr. Meyer to come back because I've got a, a few things I wanna add. Mr. Forrester. Chair and members of the committee, my name is Jeff Forrester and I am Executive Director of Minnesota Lakes and Rivers Advocates. Our membership is made up of lake and river lovers, cabin owners, lake homeowners, anglers, hunting land owners, resort owners, lake associations, county coalition of lake associations, and other people and groups that care about Minnesota's most precious resource, our waters. Um, Mr. Chair, um, I have comments for both uh, Representative Uglum's bill and the bill that's following. Do you want me to give them at the same time? Please do. Um, well, I'm here to urge the committee uh, to uh, support Representative uh, Uglum's bill. Um, this bill is a sensible fix of the trailer decal and AIS education program. Uh, with nearly one in five boats currently violating AIS laws and the rate of infestation <coughs> accelerating, now is not the time to repeal a bill directed at education. I also wanted to uh, stress strong opposition to House File 570 that would repeal the county AIS prevention aid put in place last year by this legislature. The AIS prevention aid has unleashed a remarkable and needed energy across the state. The 2015 Aquatic Invader Summit, which was set up to bring counties and their partners together to create local AIS action framework that they can use to guide local efforts, brought over 400 people from 54 counties, Wisconsin and Canada and included not only resource managers at many different governmental levels, but resort owners, lake associations, angling groups, business people, county commissioners. The AIS program aid puts money where it is needed most. AIS is a statewide problem with local consequences. The Mille Lacs DNR Blue Ribbon Panel recently pointed to the contribution of zebra mussels and spiny water flea as one of the contributing factors to the dramatic decline <coughs> of the walleye fishery. Here's a short list of what the counties are using AIS um, funding for. Uh, risk assessments so that they spend their money wisely, targeting the most vulnerable waters for increased inspections and activities, forming collaborations between counties to increase effectiveness and efficiency, increased presence at boat ramps for inspections, more decontamination units so that the public has the tools they need to do the right thing. One county resource manager told me the DNR can't stop AIS alone. The counties can't do it alone. The lake associations can't do it alone. This is going to take everyone at all levels working together. This funding supports those types of partnerships. If anyone has any questions, thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Forrester. I appreciate your interest as always in the issue um, uh, of AIS and thank you for all your work on, on behalf of the citizens and uh, lake folks in Minnesota. Commissioner Meyer, could you come forward? Um, Okay, Representative Hackbarth, was it for Mr. Forrester? No. Oh, okay, Representative Hackbarth. <coughs> well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one question, I, I'm not quite clear, does this sticker have to be renewed or is it lifetime? Uh, I'm not quite sure on that. Uh, do we have to, is it every three years, every five years? Uh, Commissioner Meyer. Chair, line 3.8 of the amendment says it's valid for three years. Just another real quick point. 
Line 2.25 says it's at, a co at no cost to the person, so there's no fee anywhere. And the civil citation is a $25 civil citation. There are no court costs or anything added to it. So it's just $25. Thank you for, for that clarification. Additional questions, Representative Hackbarth. Uh, Commissioner Meyer and uh, Representative Uglum, I've got a few things um, I'd like as you work on this bill. Um, I think the fine, if we're going to go to civil law, I don't think $25 is enough. I think we have examples in the Western states where tens of thousands of dollars. Um, so some of my colleagues would disagree with my thoughts on that. Um, Commissioner Meyer, I have said all along that uh, I'm sorry, I'm a riparian landowner without a boat trailer for my boat. But because I don't have a trailer for my boat doesn't mean that I don't have a dock and I don't have a shore station. Actually, I have both a dock and a shore station, and those are some of the most common infestation tools used to mess up our lakes. We should not be exempt of a program. We should be part of any program, and we're just uh, as potential uh, contaminants as the next person. Specifically to that point, I don't know how you're addressing it, but you should be aware that one of the most common uh, lifts is a shore station lift that allows it to have wheels put on it and a trailer hitch on the front. My guess is it's not defined as a trailer in law, but it's used to trailer. And so if we could find out how that's going to be addressed, I think the idea that we make everybody be part of this solution going forward is important. Um, I think that's the extent of my comments and I want to reiterate to Representative Hansen's point um, uh, that I think a solution is not to do nothing in the short term. As much as we know uh, the current bill which I put out as the solution in 2012 to the 2011 sticker that Representative Hansen alluded to didn't work. This has been evolving over the last five years, the last ten years, very fast and it's changing. Um, and that's why we have to make these changes, and I, I realize that. T something to this point, Representative Hackbarth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and to my other question, uh, uh, in this bill, look, it's renewable every three years. Under current law, if we do nothing, is that one also, is that sticker also three years? Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes. That's a yes. Representative Hansen, last question, and then we're going to bring uh, Representative Draskowski uh, back for informational hearing because, Representative Draskowski, there's seven people that have never had a voice on that bill heard in a House committee, and it's important that we hear from folks impacted by that Senate provision that was passed in conference committee last year. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Meyer, uh, would you be able to incorporate, or would the DNR be able to incorporate uh, the program that's been developed into your existing programs like the I Can program or the Becoming an Outdoors Woman or the variety of training programs. Could you do that now, this spring, before uh, the snow melts? It, would you be live to go uh, this year voluntarily uh, or is it impossible to do that? Mr. Chair, Mr. Meyer. we have incorporated AIS training information into our boat and water safety program already. We talk about AIS in a number of different ways. This module is ready to go. We were ready to turn the switch on. Mr. Jacobs worked very hard to make sure we would be up and running by January 1st um, to give a time for the July 1st. But with this interest with the legislature, we thought it was prudent not to do that. The intent would be once we have a clarification where this is going is, is to reactivate that. But we always continue and stress AIS and, and also other invasive species training wherever possible. Thank you. Uh, uh, Commissioner Meyer, I wanted to make a few more points on the 10 questions that you're working with Mr. Jacobs or you had were, been working with Mr. Jacobs. Question two, I already said, I, I think it's a question that should be deleted. Yep. It says uh, AIS currently in Minnesota cannot move over land without of the help of people. Absolutely, it, people are the problem there, but to make a blanket statement like that, I think just infuriates some people that absolutely believe that there's a potential for some AIS to move via an animal and where we probably know that that's highly, highly unlikely, uh, but to say it absolutely as a blanket <coughs> statement I think is wrong. Question number six uh, tells folks to uh, throw all these things, um, uh, throw them uh, in the trash. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, DNR itself uh, has created some compost piles at sites 
Um, so I, I think that, again, there, I don't know the purpose that serves. I think that question could be gone. And then the last one, before leaving the water access, you should throw all of these items in the trash. Um, actually, we have a program so that unwanted, well, you said unwanted minnows, so I suppose you're saying that means they don't want them any longer. If they want minnows, we have a program to save your minnows, or we have suggestions on how to do that. I'm not sure that that question is properly worded either, so we need a little work here. Uh, members with that, um, House File 1065 is laid over for possible inclusion. Representative Draskowski, we're going to bring House File 570 forward for an informational hearing. Representative Draskowski, I'm just going to give you one minute to say what your bill does, and I've got seven testifiers that are all going to get uh, two minutes each to give us their points because it's important they've never been heard. Representative Draskowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, uh, this bill uh, repeals the... Uh uh, the $10 million per year, actually it's $4.5 million in 2014, and $10 million per year afterwards um, uh, appropriation that uh, appeared in the uh, omnibus tax bill in 2014. Um, it was inserted in conference committee, as I understand it, uh, and this um, uh, language in statute appropriates this money to counties based on the number of boat landings they have and the number of parking stalls they have at the boat landings. Um, Mr. Chair, I learned about uh, this uh, provision actually in December when talking to one of my four counties and their finance departments, one of the four counties I represent, um, and they uh, received the check in the mail and didn't know anything about where it came from, uh, what it was for, or what to do with it. And uh, Mr. Chair and members, uh, this is a very inefficient, effective, ineffective way uh, if uh, it is the will of the legislature and the people of Minnesota to do things around AIS, uh, this is not the right way to do it. Um, uh, so we have some counties in the state that uh, uh, require or have expressed need for AIS. I would suspect those would be the counties that have a lot of lakes. Um, we have counties in my district uh, where zebra mussels in the Mississippi at one time were a problem and now um, Mother Nature has mitigated them. They are no longer a problem. Uh, there is not the need uh, for these dollars and uh, they're receiving checks in the mail and trying to figure out what to do with them. Um, Mr. Chair, a AIS doesn't belong in tax policy. It should be uh, the purview of this committee. And uh, three words, members, that I'll, I'll remind you of that you've heard uh, hundreds of times, protect, restore, and enhance. Uh, part of our 2008 constitutional amendment passed by 55.99% of the voters. Uh, suggesting that uh, that is the meaning or the uh, uh, that is the meaning behind our our constitutional amendment our legacy amendment and so I would maintain and, and hope mr. chair that uh, in the future if uh, these lake bird uh, lake uh, blessed counties um, uh, need AIS support or activities that that come from the legacy dollars rather than the general fund and uh, so this would re we repeal that from uh, the tax policy Minnesota statutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, we're going to get the uh, testimony started right away. We've got uh, three different counties that would like to come forward to speak. Uh, Representative from Crow Wing County. Please uh, state your name and who you represent for the record. Mr. Chairman, members, Paul T.D. Crow Wing County Commissioner, and with me is Jim Stratton, a Douglas County Commissioner. It's our privilege to be appointed by Commissioner Landwer at the recommendation of the Association of Minnesota Counties. To We've got the, uh, about two minutes each for yes, everyone sir. to testify. Yes, sir. I, I'm, I, I wish Commissioner McNamara, or Representative McNamara, was still there because I was going to say I've incurred his uh, witty wrath before, and I, I, I'm sure you have a similar kind. I'll just want to make very a, soon. I just want to make I a think couple. I hope you're going to be done by the time he gets back. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, more importantly, at, at 945, I have a meeting uh, that uh, on a bill that's heard for Crow Wing County for us. I, I have another appointment that I'm going to leave immediately. Well, you used up one minute. <laughs> yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, on this committee, I've learned there are a whole lot of opinions, a whole lot of uh, solutions, not very many answers to what we're doing. What this money has done is it has elevated the partnerships that are potentially available. So I'm simply here to say from my position uh, on the AS committee and as a county commissioner, if, if we withdraw the money, uh, the expectation because of the numbers, and you have a letter from our chairman of the uh, Robert Olson of the AS committee, the numbers of people that are involved in this are going to increase the pressure on the counties to then automatically backfill that dollars. And that's a concern, I think, to many counties that once we've started this, progr this progress, 
uh, the many partners that we've engaged, the many potential solutions that are out there, we need to do it as partnerships. If this money simply goes away and we don't do it, please don't force the counties then to have to use levy dollars to necessarily solve problems that are much bigger than that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mayor. Well, Commissioner Thede, and apologize um, uh, uh, for just being away. And, and welcome and thank you for c coming down. Uh, you and I are neighbors up north uh, where we have a seasonal property and you get to live in God's country year round, so uh, good for you. Um, uh, Crow Wing County serves as an example of what uh, should be done, but you also are at the uh, epicenter of unfortunately the really sad things as you know Asa Winnemakee has been infested for a number of years and uh, sure. your lake uh, is uh, probably forthcoming because the canoe can go right up from my lake to your lake. Uh, we we'll try to keep you down there though. Mr. Well at least the water's flowing in the right direction. Uh, Mr. Thede lives on Upper Hay Lake and our cabin is on Lower Hay Lake so that's the reference for folks where we're coming about but we know both know the reality uh, Zebra mussel has been found by the public landing in Lower Hay, Lower Hay Lake in the last year, and it's one of the most popular uh, public landing. And it's also a public landing where a volunteer, uh, I take that back, I believe it was one of the DNR uh, folks that they hire, the young college students, was able to uh, uh, ascertain that somebody was ready to, to uh, put in a boat with zebra mussel, or I'm sorry, with. Uh, <coughs> Raisin milfoil, I believe it was. Now that I think about it, uh, and we were able to stop that. So th there is a need for things here. So thank you. Uh, sorry, I messed up on the time here, but uh, thank you for coming forward. Next, we'll hear from uh, uh, Mr. Stratton from Douglas County. Welcome, if you could identify yourself for the record. Uh, James Stratton, uh, County Commissioner for Douglas County. Thank you for uh, allowing me the time, Mr. Chair. And Welcome, Board. Commissioner. Give us your testimony. All right. Um, I guess. Part of the part of the reason I'm here is to decide the reason why the money was given to us in the first place. Um, I feel that it was a it was a way of enlisting local involvement to a new level. It was a way of empowering those groups that we formed as a result of this this money to help to take care of local issues which are really statewide issues. Um, we've got 10,000 lakes. We've got a lot of people that live on those lakes and live off of those lakes in various forms. Um, if you don't have the resource in your county, guess what? Those constituents come to the counties that have the resource. So it's not just about zebra mussels. It's about all the other things that are com coming down the pike. We've got um, the round goby, the silver carp. Everybody knows about the silver carp. Um, Eurasian milfoil. We have hydrilla. We've got a lot of things other than just zebra mussels that we're trying to deal with. So the current proposed bill 570 will in effect take the fuel, so to speak, out of the engine that we've got started. And this is a concern that we have in our county because it is prevalent in Douglas County uh, that it will die. Thank you, Commissioner. Appreciate you coming down. Representative Cornish. Well, Mr. Chair, remember, I was just wondering if it uh, looks like Crow Wing County got a half a million bucks on the sheet. Can we get a, a printout uh, if they keep that in a separate account and what each dollar is spent on uh, what, for what purpose? R Representative Some Cornish, we'll get a, a, a breakdown further of more information. Uh, uh, Commissioner, do you want to say how you do it in, D in Douglas County? That would be uh, good uh, yes, information. Get, and then we'll find out from Crow Wing County. Uh, Mr. Co Chair and Commissioner Representative, uh, we do keep a separate account. Uh, it is not put into the general fund. It is separate. And it is accounted for. Every dollar that we spend is accounted for. As Thank you, Mr. Stratton. Seeing no other questions, uh, Mr. Walls from the, the Parks Director from Carver County, if you could come down. Thank you, Commissioner. Thanks for coming Thank down. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, members. Director. If you could identify yourself for the record and yes, give us Martin your Walsh testimony. Martin Walsh Carver County. I'm the Parks Director. Um, I'd like to touch just briefly on a few things regarding County AAS in support of the uh, prevention aid funding. Uh, with regards to some background information, Carver County has had an active program for four years. Uh, we've been providing this service on behalf of the state through a delegation agreement. <coughs> 
We have three lakes with uh, zebra mussel 17 with milfoil. Uh, to our knowledge, as others have mentioned, we don't have the other um, AIS uh, critters coming, or to our knowledge, in our lakes at this time. Um, county residents have expressed a um, need for us to protect lakes from the current threat of AIS and future threat of AIS. Regarding funding, we are utilizing several sources of funds. They include county general fund, water management organization funds, DNR grants, city contributions, and funding from homeowners associations. Our program for 2015, as compared to our previous year, we are hiring 20 more inspectors. We are now up to 45. We're doubling the service hours from 7,000 to 14,000. We're providing watercraft decontamination seven days a week with set hours. We're purchasing additional AIS informational signage for all watercraft access locations within the county. Um, we're buying techno technology devices to keep track of that information. We're implementing a trailer tag service where watercraft can be inspected on an outbound inspection and receive an expedited inspection going inbound. Thank you. Anything additional to add? Uh, just further, uh, we are also matching dollars from the Lassard Outdoor Heritage Council. They are providing grant funds for a decontamination unit, and we are matching the dollars with the county program aid um, to um, supply that labor for that. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Seeing no questions. Next, uh, Mr. Ernosti, are you in the audience? Yes, if you could come forward. Mr. Ernosti, if you could identify yourself for the record and who you represent. Thank oh, I'm you, sorry, Mr. Chair. Representative Hausman had a question. Representative Hausman. If you could speak into the mic, thank just you. Clarifying this, um, the so the first page is 2014, uh, the second is 2015. So that would be the, they haven't received any of this yet. I'm assuming, right? Uh, the 2015 <laughs> sheet. Um, uh, Representative Draskowski might that, know the answer. That's I correct, would, Mr. Chair. The first payment is on July 20th, and the second one on uh, December 26th. Okay, thanks for that clarification, Representative Draskowski. Mr. Arnosky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Don Arnosti. I represent members of the Isaac Walton League of America here in Minnesota. The Isaac Walton League is made up of uh, outdoors people who's, uh, and the mission of the organization is to conserve, restore, and promote the sustainable use and enjoyment of our natural resources, including soil, air, woods, water, and wildlife. And if you could speak to the bill, Mr. Arnosti. Yes. We um, strongly oppose House File 570. Uh, because we believe that House File 570 is actually government operating at its best. This is an example of a very complicated issue as illustrated by the thoughtful and respectful discussion that was happening this morning on the two previous bills. How best to deliver the goals that we all agree on, which is to try to control and limit the spread of uh, aquatic invasive species. Um, what House File 570 does, however, though, is knock the supports out from under the local initiatives that we've been hearing about in counties, with watershed districts, with lake associations, and I believe this is the very best way for government to engage citizens in solving the problem. Well, thank, thank you, you Mr. Anasi, for coming forward. Seeing no questions, uh, next, uh, Mr. Farnham, Kevin Farnham, if you could identify yourself for the record and who you represent. Welcome. Good to see you again. Hi, thank you. Uh, Kevin Farnham, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Chairman and uh, other committee members. My name is Kevin Farnham, and I represent Minnesota Coalition of Lake Associations, Stearns County Coalition of Lake Associations, and Coronas Lake Association in Painesville, Minnesota, as well as myself. It was very encouraging when the House passed the Minnesota Statute Section 47.7, 477A.19, Aquatic Invasive Species Prevention Aid. This was a clear sign that the legislature recognized that, that stopping the spread of aquatic invasive species was important to the state of Minnesota, that this invasion would impact all of the residents of the state, not just the shore owners or the anglers or the transient boaters. The legislature recognized that all the dollars spent by private citizens and local government unit, units almost half of what DNR was putting towards this issue was important to that mission and that these dollars might not be sustainable. <coughs> the legislature recognized that the DNR would not be able to solve this problem without the help of the residents of the state. There you recognize that the DNR will not be aggressive enough to achieve reduction in the spread across our state. And you recognize that simply increasing the budget of the DNR in this area 
would not be as effective as getting dollars at the county level and grassroots level of the lake associations across the lake and enlist others. So it is with great concern that you are second guessing a good decision that you made last year. Much of the money already received from statute 477A.19 has started to yield solid results. And as the counties, the LGUs, and lake associations, the grassroots efforts are actively getting involved, have, develop, have developed AIS plans, and getting ready for the ice out season, much hope has been generated that with the aid of the funding from this bill, <coughs> we have a chance to make a difference. Thank you. Anything additional you want to add? Yeah, with the good that has uh, that has and is happening. <laughs> Thanks for asking. I'm on my last set. <laughs> with the good that has been happening, I ask you to oppose Bill HF 570 and stop it from moving forward. Let the good continue that thank, you've already done. Th thank, thank you. And Mr. Farnham, Farnham, I don't see any questions, but I have uh, just a comment to your to your point that with the passage of that House file, it was a signal that all 134 House members supported that initiative. Uh, that was an initiative that was put in the dark of night in conference committee and a tax bill. Uh, it was never heard in this House Environment Committee, and I don't know that all of us agree with your statement that we feel absolutely the DNR should be held in the dark on the funding for AIS. Um, so I respect your opinion. The counties do great work. The local lake associations do fantastic work, but I don't know if we should be spending $10 million for aquatic invasive species and uh, keep the DNR out of the loop. So I want to just clarify that's one of the reasons we're having this discussion is some of us feel it would have been better to be coordinated more closely with the DNR in their work on IAS. So, so thank you for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you it. for your opinion. Yeah. Mr. Carlson, if you want to come forward and give us your uh, brief comments. And then, uh, Mrs. Davis White, if we have time, I'll bring you back down uh, for a comment. Otherwise, we did hear from you extensively previously. Mr. Carlson. Mr. Chair, uh, Keith Carlson, Minnesota Inter County Association, whose member includes some of the larger recipients of this money, but also some of the smaller um, Otter Tail, Crow Wing, uh, St. Louis County, and the former uh, Carver County, Winona County, Olmstead. We are in opposition to this bill, although it was relatively late notice that we received. Uh, I think, as, as is obvious here, counties have really embraced this um, this measure. Uh, for example, to answer um, Representative Cornish's question, uh, Co Crow Wing County is receiving $450,000 uh, in this calendar year from this. Uh, their budgeted expenditure for this program is uh, over $489,000, so this is leveraging additional funds. Uh, they are largely relying on volunteers for their efforts, uh, leveraging additional benefits. Um, there is a um, webinar that our organization, AMC, produced in conjunction with uh, the Department of Natural Resources and is currently on the AIS uh, site. Uh, since then, we have also had a webinar that was done by the Sea uh, Grant program up at UMD. Um, so we are engaged uh, extensively on this uh, and believe these monies are being put to good use. With that, I'll conclude. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. Uh, I'd like to ask if anybody in the audience, and I appreciate Ms. White, uh, you have already testified and we hear uh, good comments from you. I would appreciate if you could electronically send us your entire comments. I think I asked for that. There's one other testifier that wanted to come forward. It's good to see a familiar face. If you could identify yourself for the record and who you represent, you got one minute. Mr. Chairman and uh, committee members, uh, my name is Tom Watson. I'm president of the Whitefish Area Property Owners Association. I just want to say a couple of minutes, uh, one minute. We're the largest nonprofit member Lake Association in Minnesota. We represent 1,200 members, paid members, 100 who are business owners, 1,100 who are guests and property owners in the area. Number two, the population of the Whitefish chain of lakes, we are the ninth largest public body of water measured on surface area in Minnesota. We're larger than Minnetonka. One third of the guests in our area, by a study from the University of Minnesota, come from north central Minnesota. Two thirds come from outside the north central area. In other words, we're an area where people visit the area for tourism, recreation, and otherwise. Thank you. I that same University of Minnesota piece of information, Mr. McNamara, 
indicated that the revenue generated by tourism travel in that area, this was 2008, was $150 million a year. These were people whose addresses in the survey were more than 50 miles away from the border of Crow Wing County. Th My thanks. point is this bill is also an economic interest in addition to an environmental interest. And we have another 150 species of aquatic invasive sea species sitting in the, in the Great Lakes, which have been coming. That's the source of everything we're dealing with. So we only see the tip of the iceberg. We Thank want you to keep the AIS appropriation. Thank you. And if you could spell your last name as you weren't on the testifier list. W-A-T-S-O-N. Thank you, Mr. Watson. And in full disclosure, I am a member of WAPOA. Did you pay your dues in 2015 yet? I did, <laughs> yes. I, Mr. Watson, I did. And I will say the dues is well spent. And uh, as you know, $30 our, a year. Our lake association is probably the number one uh, association, and it's great work uh, in the fight for this. So I appreciate you coming down. Uh, Representative Hausman, you have the last question, then we're out of here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My, mine is just uh, uh, a comment. I am very grateful for Mr. Teedy, Mr. Stratton, Mr. Walsh, Mr. Arnosti, Mr. Farnham, Farnham, and this gentleman. I mean, what we're hearing finally in our last testimony is how engaged the grassroots is all over the state. And this is an issue that we shouldn't just assume we can sit around a table here and figure it out uh, in consultation with the DNR. But ultimately, unless we engage this entire state, and the, I, mean, I am so hopeful by uh, the testimony of all of these last people, they are engaged, they understand, and they are ready to actually help solve this problem. So. I'm hoping that, that as we go forward that we show huge respect for the, the kind of testimony we just heard. Thank you, Representative Houseman. We're adjourned.